Hi, it's Carrie again with the Topeka and Shawnee County Public Library. Welcome to Read a Palooza. In today's session, I'm going to be reading you two more chapters in Ranger and Time Rescue on the Oregon Trail. I'm going to read chapters 13 and 14. Don't forget to get your map out so that you're ready for the fate cards at the end. Uh, last time when Tanya read to you in chapters 11 and 12, we had kind of left off at a cliffhanger, an exciting moment where Sam's paw was drowning in the river. So that's where I'm going to pick up today. So chapter 13 is called Grab the Rope. Behind Ranger, the air was full of screams and cries, splashes and neighs and snorts. But Ranger ran straight for the wagon. He had seen rope earlier when Ma and Pa prepared the wagon for the ferry crossing. Where was it now? Ranger jumped onto the tailgate and climbed between two barrels of flour. He spotted a rope that secured a trunk to the side of the wagon, but when he bit the end and tugged on it, the knots only pulled tighter. There had to be more rope, rope that was strong and long enough and not all tied up to something. Ranger jumped over a wooden trunk and sniffed at the tools that hung along the sides of the wagon. Iron, steel, rust. Finally, he smelled something else, fiber and sweat, and found a thick coil of rope tucked behind a crate of dried fruit. Ranger clamped his teeth on the rope and tugged as hard as he could. The rope came loose. Ranger took the end in his mouth, leaped from the wagon, and ran for the riverbank. Lizzie held Isaac in her arms and clutched Amelia's hand. Sam was with Ma, practically holding her up as they shouted to Mr. To Mr. Harrigan over the raging water. Dr. Loring called to the other men for help. Ranger raced up to Sam and thrust the rope at his hands. You brought rope! Sam grabbed it, but Ranger tugged one end back and plunged into the water. With the rope in his teeth, he swam past Mr. Harrigan and Bess toward the place where he had last seen Pa. The air was wet and full of smells, horse sweat and river plants and fish. Ranger caught the scent of death, too, rising up from the water. There were bodies down there, but Pa was still alive. Ranger could smell him. His scent got stronger as Ranger let the river carry him farther downstream. But there was no sign of Pa in the water, and Ranger was getting tired. The current fought against him. It tugged at his rope and whipped a loop around his legs. He had to kick them free to keep swimming. It got harder and harder to keep his head out of the water so he could see. Ranger knew he couldn't last much longer. He'd have to let go of the rope and swim to shore. He'd have to rest and breathe and try again. But would Pa's alive and fighting smell still be strong then? The rope jerked tight. Ranger almost lost it, but he clamped his teeth down hard and held on. Ranger felt the water rushing past him. He had run out of rope. Sam held tight to the other end on the bank. Ranger couldn't go any farther without letting go. Ranger struggled to lift his head. He couldn't see Sam or Mr. Harrigan anymore, but he caught a splash in the water just a dog's length or two away. A hand shot out of the waves, flailing at the air, grabbing at nothing. Then, for a flash of a moment, Ranger saw Pa's terrified face gasping for breath before he was swept underwater again. Ranger kicked as hard as he could back upstream. He had to battle the current to move even the tiniest bit. The rope scratched his mouth and his tongue. The river slapped at his face, but Ranger swam as hard as he could. Finally, his paw touched something solid, the rough, wet fabric of Pa's shirt. Pa's arm jerked away, and then his head popped out of the water. He coughed, taking in great, desperate gulps of air. His arms flopped and slapped at the river as he tried to stay afloat. The rope! Ranger swam closer. Here, he thought, take it! In the swift water training with Dad and Luke, the person had taken the rope right away. Ranger had been watching from the boat. The rope came and the person grabbed it and got saved. But this was different. Training hadn't smelled like this, like fear and panic and coughed up river water. Ranger swam right up beside Pa, kicked him in the shoulder, and poked him in the ear with his nose. Finally, Pa's eyes focused on the dog and then, yes, he lunged at the rope. Sam must have seen Pa's hand close around it because right away the rope pulled tight again. Ranger wasn't sure Paul was strong enough to keep hanging on, so he tried to swim beside him. But Ranger was exhausted, and the current was strong. It was starting to pull him away from Pa, away from the rope and safety. Pa flung an arm around Ranger and held him tight until they finally saw Sam tugging on that rope. Sam cried when he finally saw his Pa. 
He and Dr. Loring pulled Pa and Ranger all the way into shore until the water was shallow enough for Pa to crawl. Then they splashed out to help him onto dry land. Pa coughed up some water, then flopped onto his back and looked up at the sky. Ranger stood in the mud and looked up too. It felt like something should happen. He'd rescued Pa. Would Luke come and take him home now? But when he heard the words, good job, it was Sam's voice, not Luke's. You're such a good boy. Sam put his face close to Ranger's. I love you, dog. Ranger loved Sam too, but he was still all wet. Ranger shook water onto Sam and everyone laughed. Nothing had ever sounded so good. Later, when all the clothes were hung up to dry, Ma gave Ranger that slab of bacon she'd promised him. You deserve that and more, dog. She patted him on the head and Ranger woofed down the meat. But Sam wasn't eating. Ma raised her eyebrows. Did all that adventure steal away your appetite? Sam shrugged. He'd been quiet all night and Ranger thought he felt warm, maybe too warm. Ranger sniffed at Sam's temple and whined. Ma squatted down next to Sam and put her hand to his forehead. Ranger felt the air change again. The smell of fear was back, even before it crackled out in Ma's voice. Get the medicine chest, Lizzie. He's burning up. So poor Sam has a fever. So let's look at uh, chapter 13 discussion question here. We just have one today. What did Ranger think would happen once he had saved Pa from drowning? Okay, so now we're ready for chapter 14, which is called Fever Dreams. Here's a picture from the chapter. Sam didn't eat anything at supper or at breakfast the next morning. Ma and Pa settled him in some blankets piled on a trunk in the wagon, and he rode there for the next three days. Ranger walked alongside Lizzie and Amelia, but every time the wagon stopped, he leaped onto the back and found his way back to Sam. Dr. Loring came by at the end of every day on the trail. He cut Sam's arm so the bad blood could drain out, but Sam still shivered under his scratchy wool blanket. Ma was afraid he had cholera, like Sarah's mother and father. But Dr. Loring pointed to the red spots spreading from Sam's wrists and ankles right up his arms and legs. Mountain fever, he said, studying the rash. It's dangerous, but I think he'll make it. On the morning of the fourth day, Sam's skin wasn't so hot. He even got up and walked behind the wagon for a bit. But when night fell, the fever came back, and it was worse, much worse. Sam was shaking his head and twitching his limbs as if some invisible wolf had gotten a hold of him. Dr. Loring came and gave Sam some medicine, but he spit it back up. Dr. Loring turned to Ma and shook his head. The second phase is usually worse than the first. All we can do is pray. Come on, dog, get down, Lizzie called, but Ranger wouldn't leave Sam's side. When Luke was sick last year, Ranger had stayed with him the whole time, sleeping beside him in bed. Luke had gotten better. Sam would too. He had to, didn't he? Days passed, but Sam didn't improve. When Sam shivered, Ranger curled up close to him. When Sam cried out, Ranger licked his hand. Mostly, Ranger sat beside him, keeping watch. Ranger heard Lizzie say they were almost to the Oregon Territory. Any day, Uncle Thomas would come down the river to meet them and see them back to the farm. Sam had to get better. He'd waited so long to see this new country. Ranger ate the scraps that were offered at night, but nothing tasted the same when Sam wasn't eating. The days blurred together until finally Ranger woke one morning to find Sam sitting up beside him, blinking into the rising sun. Good morning, dog. I'm thirsty and hungry, I think. Ranger wasn't sure what Sam wanted, but he understood the most important thing. Sam was back. Ranger barked and Ma came running. She just about smothered Sam in hugs and cornbread. When Sam first stood up, his legs were as wobbly as a newborn colt's, but the color was coming back to his cheeks. At the end of the day, a wagon appeared on the trail, coming from the other direction. Ma raised her hand to shade her eyes from the sun. William, I do believe that's your brother's team. Lizzie gathered her skirts in her arms and broke into a run. Even though he was still weak, Sam took Amelia's hand and followed. Uncle Thomas! The wagon stopped alongside the trail. A sturdy-looking man jumped down from his horse and came running with a floppy-eared dog alongside him. Uncle Thomas looked a little older than Pa, with the same scruffy red hair and green eyes. He rushed up to the abbot's wagon, hugging Ma and fussing over the baby and telling Amelia how grown up she was. The dog nearly knocked Amelia off her feet. Finnegan, Uncle Thomas called and the dog barked. Leave that little miss alone. Finnegan jumped up on Sam and nuzzled his hand. 
Does Finnegan live on the farm? Sam asked. Uncle Thomas nodded. He'll wake you up every morning, I promise. Did you hear that, dog? Sam turned to the wagon where Ranger had been standing watching. Ranger barked and tipped his head, but he stayed by the wagon. He had heard Uncle Thomas. He'd heard Sam. And now he heard something else. A high-pitched humming coming from inside the wagon. It was getting louder and louder. Ranger hopped up on the tailgate and found it right away. The metal box from the garden at home was there where Ma had tucked it next to the tools on that first day, way back in the dusty square. The box was vibrating urgently. Ranger had done a good job. Now it was time to go home. Ranger grabbed the leather strap with his teeth, dragged it to the wagon's tailgate, and jumped down. Sam was watching him. Ranger knew he couldn't leave without saying goodbye. Everyone was getting ready to start off again to finish the journey. The metal box was humming so loud it seemed to be shaking the whole earth. But Ranger set it down in the dirt, ran to Sam, and licked his hand. Dog, this is Finnegan, Sam said, squatting to introduce them. Finnegan nuzzled Sam's ear, then turned to look at Ranger curiously. Who are you? The other dog seemed to ask. Finnegan sniffed Ranger as if he didn't quite belong. We're going home now, Sam said to the farm. Ranger sniffed Finnegan. He was a good dog. He would take care of Sam. Sam, come along, Paul called. We need to make 10 more miles before dark. Ranger licked Sam's hand once more and turned away. Where are you going, dog? Sam looked confused. He stood up and one of the quilt squares fluttered down from his pocket. Aren't you coming? Ranger sniffed the square, then picked it up carefully in his teeth. You want to carry that for me? Here. Sam took the bit of fabric and tucked it under Ranger's collar. All set now? Let's go, son, Pa called. That dog will follow if he wants to. We need to get moving. But Sam didn't move. He watched Ranger trot back to the first aid kit and sit down. Finally, Sam nodded as if he understood. Thanks, dog, he said quietly. But Ranger heard, even over the humming that threatened to swallow him up, he watched Sam run to catch up with Lizzie and Finnegan in the wagon. When Ranger nuzzled the dusty leather strap over his head, the humming drowned out all the sounds of the trail, the snorting and shouting, the clomping of oxen hooves, and the neighing of horses. Ranger saw a pinprick of white light that grew bigger and bigger until it swallowed up the Oregon sun, and Ranger had to close his eyes. When he opened them, there was a squirrel. And that is the end of chapter 14. So a couple discussion questions. What was Ranger's reaction to Finnegan? And number two, what happened to Ranger at the end of the chapter? And we only have one more chapter left to go in this book that will be in the next Rita Palooza session. Okay, time that you've been waiting for. It's time for fate cards. So make sure you have that map and a coin, some dice, and a pencil to mark where you leave off on the trail. Hopefully the fate cards have been good to you along the way. Fake card number one today is you fell into a large cactus. Oh no, when your wagon hit a huge rock. It takes you the rest of the day to extract the spines and you're very sore for several weeks. You must stand up for 30 minutes to avoid this fate. If you can do this, you can move ahead four dots. Otherwise, you must remain where you are. Okay, I guess for this fake card, you didn't need dice or coins. So you have to try to stand up for 30 minutes and then you can move ahead four dots. All right, fake card two. You have come down with a very high fever. Oh, just like Sam did in the last chapter and a bad case of dysentery. What is dysentery? Research the symptoms of this sickness and write them in a short paragraph. If you do this, you can move ahead three dots. If not, you remain where you are on the map. Okay. Thank you for joining me today for Rita Palooza. Don't forget to sign up for the summer reading challenge at tscpl.org slash summer. Our time together today counts toward your minutes read. You can score 20 minutes towards rewards at tscpl.org slash summer.